Let's see how quickly we can cover the required practicals for Edexcel Pearson GCSE Physics. You can see me and others from Armsbury Science carrying out some of these experiments for real over on that channel. First, some tips that you should always keep in mind when answering a question on a practical in your exams. Remember that in many of these investigations, there's an independent variable, the thing you change, a dependent variable, the other thing that changes as a result, which you measure and controls. Variables that could change, but we keep them the same throughout in order to ensure that results are accurate. Always say what piece of equipment you use for each measurement. Don't just say measure the length of the object. Also add with a ruler or whatever you're using. That's a mark in itself. State the flipping obvious. If you think, surely they don't want me to put that, put it down anyway. You never know what marks you might pick up. Talk about the accuracy of measurements. How will you reduce errors and uncertainties? For example, you get your eye in line with the measurement when using a ruler or measuring cylinder to reduce parallax error. Another classic thing you should put down is multiple or repeat measurements or readings to calculate a mean from. Finally, it's okay to write your answers in bullet point format. In fact, I recommend it as it helps you and the examiner keep track of how many different points are being made. Because I'm trying to fit loads in here, you might see me write abbreviated points for the sake of brevity, but when you write a point, do it in full. Make sure you use proper English. Don't start going all Tarzan like saying, heat liquid with fire. More like heat the water gently on a gauze on a tripod over a Bunsen burner flame. Also, don't forget that you can see me and others from Malmesbury Science doing these practicals for realsies on Malmesbury Education. Link is in the description. Let's go. Physics 1, find Newton's second law, F equals ma, force equals mass times acceleration. We do this by attaching slotted masses to a trolley on a track or the slider on an air track with the string going over a pulley. We let the masses fall, which accelerates the trolley. A flag on the trolley will pass through two light gates or photo gates and the computer or data logger will calculate the acceleration. There are two alternatives. We can just use one light gate to get its final velocity and use Newton's equation of motion. If you have no light gates, you can just use a stop clock to get the time taken to go a certain distance. Using another of Newton's equations, we can again get the acceleration. We change the force accelerating the trolley by removing masses, but these must be placed on the trolley every time. Why? Well, that's because the force of gravity is not only accelerating the trolley, but also the masses themselves. So we must keep the total mass constant. Get the force by multiplying the mass by g every time, plot the force against acceleration, and you should once more end up with a proportional relationship, a straight line going through the origin. As f equals ma, the gradient of this line should be equal to the mass of the trolley and masses. Physics 2. Waves. A few different variations here. Using a ripple tank, you can just use light to project an image of the waves onto a screen or piece of paper. Using a ruler, you can measure the length of 10 waves, say, then divide by 10 to get the wavelength. This is much easier if the oscillator making the waves is also connected to a strobe light, so the waves appear stationary on the screen. The signal generator that's driving the oscillator should also tell you the frequency being used. If you change the frequency, the wavelength will change, but according to the wave equation v equals f lambda, the wave speed v should remain constant. That is, unless you change the depth of the water. You could also just count the number of waves reaching the end of the tank over 10 seconds if they're slow enough, then divide by 10 to get the frequency waves per second. The other prac involves getting an oscillator, aka a vibration generator, to produce a stationary wave on a string with masses on the end over a pulley to provide some tension. We might also use a bridge instead. You need to vary the frequency until you get the simplest stationary wave formed on the string one loop. At this point, the length of the string to the pulley or the bridge is equal to half the wavelength of the wave. Using this with the frequency driving the oscillator, we can again calculate wave speed. Physics 3. Refraction. All we do is shine a ray of light from a ray box into a glass or perspex block. We draw around the block, mark where the light enters and leaves, draw these up with a ruler, and then measure the angles of incidence and refraction. Don't forget that every angle must be measured from the normal, the line that's 90 degrees to the surface. We could use a semicircular block instead. We change the angle of incidence, then measure what the new angle of refraction is. Plotting sine i against sine r will give you a straight line. And the gradient of this graph gives us what we call the refractive index of the material. Physics 4. Infrared absorption. Easy peasy this one. Just fill a Leslie cube with hot water from a kettle. It's got different surfaces on its four sides. Using an infrared detector or infrared thermometer, we can detect how much heat is radiated from each side. You'll find matte black is the best emitter of infrared, whereas shiny silvery surfaces are the worst. Another part we can do is just have boiling tubes wrapped in different materials with a thermometer through a bung in the top of each, have the sun or a lamp shine on them and record their temperatures after a set time. You'll find that matte black is not only the best emitter of infrared, it's also the best absorber, while shiny surfaces are the worst absorbers, which makes sense as they reflect light well, so it's also true for infrared. Physics 5. Circuits. 
Now, there's all sorts of little different experiments that you can do for this, like resistance in series and parallel on thermistors and LDRs, etc. But I'm just going to do the standard resistance of a length of wire. If you want to see the other ones, just watch my electricity video. We just want to see the relationship between length of a wire and its resistance. We use constantan wire as its resistance doesn't change much when it gets hotter, which is what we want. Attach the wires using crocodile clips and cables to a battery, an ammeter in series to measure the current, and a voltmeter in parallel to measure the PD. Change the distance between the two crocodile clips to change the effective length of the wire, and measure this with a meter rule, making sure the wire is taut when you do this. Calculate resistance for each length by rearranging Ohm's law. Resistance is equal to voltage, PD divided by current. Plot resistance against length, and you should end up with a directly proportional relationship. That is a straight line that goes through the origin, if you extrapolate the line of best fit. Physics 6. Density. This one often crops up in exam questions, finding the density of objects or solutions. To find the mass of any solid object, just place it on a top pan balance. If it's a regular object, say a cuboid or a cylinder, you can measure its dimensions with a ruler or vernier calipers that has a higher resolution and calculate its volume from these. Then use the equation mass divided by volume to find the density. For any irregular object, like a stone or a lumpy thing for which we can't calculate the volume, we use a displacement or eureka can. Fill it up with water to the spout, lower the object down with string until submerged, and collect the water displaced with a beaker. Put this into a measuring cylinder to get an accurate value for the volume of the object to calculate the density from, again using the equation. You can find the density of a solution by putting a measuring cylinder on a balance and zeroing, then pouring in the solution, allowing you to find the mass and volume. Pure water has a density of 1 gram per centimetre cubed. So if you find that the density of, say, a salt solution is 1.2 grams per centimetre cubed, that means that the concentration of the salt is 0.2 grams per centimetre cubed. Physics 7, properties of water, that's SHC and SLH. We want to calculate the specific heat capacity and specific latent heat of fusion of water. We heat water in a beaker with an electric heater. The current and PD supplied are used to calculate the power to the heater. Then we multiply that by the time and that gives us the total energy input. Measuring the change in temperature of the water using a thermometer or temperature probe along with the mass allows us to calculate its SHC, which hopefully is close to the true value of 4,200 joules per kilogram per degree C. For SLH, we put ice in a funnel with the electric heater, with a beaker underneath to catch the water produced. You only start timing once the first bit of water drips down, as we don't want to include the energy needed to bring the temperature up to the melting point of zero degrees. Stop timing once there is no more ice, and similar to before, we calculate the energy input using V times I times T, divided by the mass of the ice, and you have your SLH, a fusion of water, which hopefully should be close to 334,000 joules per kilogram. The issue with both of these experiments is that the thermal energy will continually be transferred to the surroundings, meaning that the measured energy input will inevitably be higher than the true value for the energy needed to raise the temperature of the water or melt the ice. So you'll want to think about how to reduce this, say by using insulation or a lid. Physics 8, springs. We can find the spring constant for a spring by fixing one end on a retort stand and a clamp and hanging slotted masses of increasing mass to change the force on the spring, that's our independent variable, and measuring the extension, that's our dependent variable. The best way of measuring extension is to fix a ruler as close to the spring as possible with the zero mark lined up with the bottom of the spring then just measure where the bottom of the spring goes to when it's stretched. Multiply the mass by gravitational field strength, 9.8, every time to get the force. Plot this against extension. Even though you might think the axis should be the other way around, it makes it such that the gradient of the line gives you the spring constant in newtons per meter, or newtons per centimeter, if you kept your extensions in centimeters. This is where Hooke's law, F equals Ke, comes from, where K is the spring constant. This should be a straight line that goes through the origin, showing that this is a directly proportional relationship. Leave a like and a comment if you found this helpful. Click on the card to go to the Malmesbury Science playlist or the other card to go to the videos covering whole papers. See you next time.